Okay, how's everybody doing today? How's studying coming for the exam? Good, I'm happy to hear that. It's better than the moans I hear sometimes, so. There's probably plenty of those, I'm guessing, right? How are you feeling about it? Eh? That's a common reaction, too. Good, bad, indifferent, eh, indifferent. You know what I find, well, that's always true, though, right? Um, I find students are extraordinarily superstitious. Nobody will ever say, even if they feel like they're ready for it, that they will say that they're ready for it. I've never found anybody who will say that. Uh, maybe it's because they're afraid that their peers will hate them. I don't know. Um, well, this is going to work the way I said uh, the other day, so I will take your questions. Please make sure that there are things that you're, you know, you have questions about something. Just saying go over this really isn't something I'll just say, well, watch the video, because that's, that's what I've done before. So if you have some questions, that's the way that this works the best. And people who watch it who aren't here, of course, then are getting a more, you know, good focus on the things that are important. So. Hopefully, uh, you are getting things from the videos. And where there are things that you don't understand, of course, that's why we have this. So um, that said, I'll shut up and take your questions. What would you like to know? Yeah, back in the back. My question regards pyruvate dehydrogenase mechanism. Pyruvate dehydrogenase mechanism. Okay, so let's go uh, through the uh, reaction mechanism here. Uh, well, I don't want that. That'll scare everybody. Okay, so um, your question was where does the lipoamide come into the, the equation? Okay. Okay, so good question. So what's the form of the lipoamide? before it gets involved in the reaction, basically, okay? So the lipoamide um, is a form of lipoic acid, and lipoic acid is a vitamin or vitamin-like substance, and it's necessary for this reaction. So lipoic acid becomes covalently joined to the um, uh, E2, as you can see right here. So there are three subunits of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, E1, E2, and E3, and they catalyze the reactions roughly as I've indicated on the screen, okay? Um, when you join lipoic acid to a lysine, you make something called lipoamides. So that's a covalent bond between the E2 complex, and E2 part of the complex, and the uh, lipoic acid. That makes something called lipoamide. Now, the form of lipoamide that's there before um, acid aldehyde gets attached to it, the lipoamide is present in a disulfide bond configuration, meaning it's a sulfur-sulfur bond. And the transfer of the acid aldehyde to that lipoamide by the TPP results in the acid aldehyde donating two electrons to the um, disulfide bond and that causes the disulfide bond to break and form a free sulfhydryl on one side and a thioester bond, an S bonded to a carbon, double bonded to an oxygen, okay? A thioester bond to the acetyl group. So you've gone from an acid aldehyde group to an acetyl group and that's, that's the oxidation. So we see oxidation occurring of the acid aldehyde to the acetyl we see the reduction of the disulfide bond of the lipoamide to a sulfhydryl. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I like this figure actually because I think it shows pretty clearly what's uh, going on. You have to keep in mind that there are transfers that are happening in here. So some places will list, you know, the um, uh, electron transfer occurring in E1, for example, because this process is happening as it's being donated to E2. So um, the exact locations of these things aren't really critical. But for our purposes, this is where everything occurs. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, for the FAB and the NAD parts, does the NAD get its um, electrons from the acetyl group? 
Okay, so that's a very good question, actually. So her question is, um, NADH is, uh, or NAD is getting reduced to NADH in uh, the E3 part of the complex. Is the NAD getting its electrons from FADH2? And the answer is, yes, it is. And this is a very unusual reaction, okay? There's generally not enough energy in the electrons in FAD to transfer them to Na, I'm sorry, in FADH2 to transfer them to NAD to make NADH. We don't see this happening in other places. So how is it that here there's enough energy to do that? And the answer is rooted in the fact that these, uh, the electronic environment of the E3 is different than other enzymes that bind these substances, okay? So consequently, the nature of that FADH2 is different than a free FADH2 just floating around out in the cell. And it's because of that that FADH2 donates its electrons to NAD to make NADH. We don't see that really happening in other places. There's one other place it might happen. Where, where do you think that might be? It's a good exam question. And yes, you should know the answer to that. Yes. So well, I'm, I'm asking a question. Let's let's let, let's let's answer that question first. So the question was: I said that this is a very unusual reaction. This unusual reaction happens here. We don't see it happening hardly any place else. But I said there is some other place that you should be able to think about where that might occur. You've act, we've actually covered it in class. What's that? Um, well, um, yeah, sort of, yeah, what, 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 but can you be more specific? Not in a complex, nope. It has to do with alpha ketoglutarate. So, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase uses exactly the same mechanism, right? It uses exactly the same five coenzymes, everything the same is going on, and you've seen that, right? So that's, that would be the answer to the question. It, it occurs in alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase as well. Good. Good for you. Okay, now you had a question? Yeah. <laughs> so pyrimidine dehydrogenase is activated when the dual disulfide bond is reduced. Okay, so alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, its regulation has to do uh, with... with no, no, the disulfide bond is just part of the, the reaction mechanism. This has nothing to do with the activation of the enzyme. Okay. So the activation of the enzyme occurs when the pyruvate dehydrogenase gets dephosphorylated, right? So phosphorylation of pyruvate dehydrogenase inactivates it. Dephosphorylation uh, of, I'm sorry, phosphorylation inactivates it, dephosphorylation activates it. Okay? This is a necessary step in the reaction mechanism, but this is not part of the activation process. Yes? And that would be how it's allosterically regulated? So the enzyme's allosteric regulation, whenever we say allosteric regulation, we're talking about non-covalent regulation. Oh, okay. So allosteric regulation always involves binding of a molecule to an enzyme to affect its activity. Okay? When we talk about covalent modification, that's not allosteric regulation. That's covalent modification. Okay? Yes? So is phosphorylating it covalent? Phosphorylating it is absolutely covalent, uh, absolutely covalent modification. Yes, yes. Or dephosphorylating it is too. Right? Anything that makes or breaks covalent bonds is going to be uh, covalent modification. Yes? So the question had to do with what I said about the citric acid cycle and knowing which reactions had very negative delta G0 prime uh, uh, values or very positive delta G0 prime values. There are some fairly negative values associated with the decarboxylations. I have not talked about those and consequently I won't ask you to know those. 
But there are, there is one reaction that I said had a very negative delta G zero prime, and that was the citrate synthase reaction, where the acetyl CoA is joined to the oxaloacetate to make citrate. That has a very negative delta G zero prime, and that's important because it pulls the reaction preceding it, which is catalyzed by the malate dehydrogenase, which has a fairly positive delta G zero prime. So those two together are important in terms of energy. Does that answer your question? Yes? Is there a, rea a reaction in the citric acid cycle that has a delta G zero prime equal to zero? Yeah. Well, there's nothing that has a, a value exactly equal to zero. There are some that are close to that, yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Would the reaction be close to would be close to zero. Aconitase is simply an isomerization reaction, and those generally will be fairly close to zero. Yeah, it would be, yeah. But again, you're not responsible for that. So, yeah, was there a question over here? Yeah. I have a question about ketone body metabolism. About what? Uh, ketone, ketone, ketone body metabolism, okay. Yeah. Um, so, when you're making ketone bodies, you would get down to acetyl acetate, and then it can be the aromatase either forms ketone or acetone. Okay. So the question has to do with ketone body metabolism, and somebody else uh, uh, asked me this question earlier today also. Basically, what's going on in the blood, if I, under, if I could just uh, paraphrase what you're uh, saying there. So um, let's um, overview here. Uh, uh, nope, not that. Um, acetate ketone bodies. Yeah, okay. So what's going on with what's happening in the blood? Well, the question I was asked today, which was uh, similar but not exactly the same, was why um, do you have, or, or basically, do you have acetoacetate in your blood? Because this, re this process shows everything going down to here or to here, okay? And the, uh, the answer to the question is that um, the formation of hydroxybutyrate from acetoacetate is um, a reaction that isn't regulated as far as I know, okay? So it's probably controlled by the level of NADH, meaning that in the bloodstream you have both acetoacetate and you have beta-hydroxybutyrate. Of the two, Beta-hydroxybutyrate, this guy here is the more stable, but it doesn't mean that the acetoacetate is absent in the blood. Now, why do I say that? Well, that's important because if acetoacetate is present in the blood, some of it is going to spontaneously go this direction, and that's how you smell the acetone on a person's breath. But the answer to the question is both acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate are both present in the blood when ketone bodies are being made. Does that answer your question? I just didn't know if it favors Right, right. And I haven't said it favors one versus the other. Um, uh, my suspicion, and I'm not an expert in this, but my suspicion is that it'll be fairly strongly favored in this direction. Um, but it's really going to depend a lot on the concentration of NADH. Yes, ma'am. So when the um, beta hydroxybutyrate reaches its like, target where it wants to be, mm -hmm. um, it like, reverses back into making the two acetyl-CoAs, yep. which then make energy. Make Correct. So the question was when this uh, beta hydroxybutyrate gets back to, uh, gets to the target cells, let's say it's a brain cell that needs glucose, uh, for example, then this entire process reverses. And it reverses specifically for the purpose of making those, of releasing those two acetyl CoAs so they can be used in the citric acid cycle to generate energy. Yep. So we really, if you think about it, have two very good mechanisms in the body for getting acetyl CoA into the citric acid cycle in tissues that need it. Okay? The most common one is glucose transport in the blood. Glucose readily moves in the blood. If you have plenty of glucose, it's going to the target cells. The target cells are taking it. They're doing glycolysis. 
They're converting pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, and bang, they've got acetyl-CoA. If glucose levels are low, as they may be during starvation or as they may be during uh, diabetic um, uh, problems, then uh, ketone bodies are made, and the ketone bodies are important for going back this direction. You say, well, where do these ketone body things come from? And the answer is they can come from a variety of sources. Acetyl-CoA doesn't have to come from glucose. Your liver, uh, for example, has fat in it, as I mentioned today. So you break down fat to fatty acids, as we'll see next week. When you convert fat, you break down fatty acids, you make acetyl-CoA. So your liver's got an abundance of things to go this way to make the beta-hydroxybutyrate. Then it just dumps this into the bloodstream so that it can take it to the brain, for example, and the brain can now do the, re the reverse reaction to make the acetyl-CoA. Short question, long answer. Yes? Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, I've been asked that question two or three times this term. Why doesn't acetyl-CoA just transfer uh, in the blood? I don't have a good answer for that question. And it's always an unsatisfying answer whenever I say that's the way the system evolved. And that's the way the system evolved. Uh, yes, back in the back. Um, you have a diagram that shows the HMG-CoA. Mm-hmm. Well, the acetoacetate right here, okay, in this system, it just goes up and makes acetyl-CoA. If you're talking about the liver packaging things, then the acetoacetate could be used to make hydroxy, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a more stable form of a ketone body that could travel more readily in the bloodstream. So this guy here can go up, it can go down, depending upon the tissue that it's in. Okay, so the question, uh, do you know which figure that was? Uh, it's the next one. The next one, okay, well, let me go to the next one to, to explain it directly uh, for you. So if we go here, I think, right? Okay, so the question is, well, where does this extra acetyl-CoA come from? This guy has six carbons. So if you pull off an acetyl-CoA, you're left behind with acetoacetate. So this guy has six. Notice we started with acetoacetyl-CoA plus acetyl-CoA. That's two carbons here, four carbons here, okay? That makes uh, a six-carbon molecule, which is the HMG-CoA. We pull an acetyl-CoA off of that, which is what we do here. We're left behind with four carbons, which are acetoacetate, okay? So this is only going to happen in ketone body synthesis. What you saw today is what happens in the other direction, okay? Yes? Okay, so the acetone that pops up in the other reaction, does the body do anything with that? The primary thing that happens with the um, acetone is that it's exhaled. So acetone is a volatile organic compound, and volatile organic compounds generally are lost by the body. Carbon dioxide is a real good example. You produce carbon dioxide, you exhale it from your lungs, it's a gas, it's out of there, and you want it to be out of there. That's what happens with, a, with acetone, for the most part. There are actually enzymes that will handle acetone, but they're a very minor component of the overall metabolism. For the most part, acetone is simply lost. Clear as mud, huh? Question? Yeah. Um, yeah. So regarding the, the core recycle, yeah. um, it, uses lac it uses lactate uh -huh. that goes to the liver. Yep. But I don't really understand the purpose of like, why you use it because it yeah. seems like it's kind of energy investment. Okay. So this is a question somebody asked, else asked me after class today. So you know, one of the things I always say is always ask me questions because your questions are very common questions. And so that, uh, you ask it and a lot of other people learn uh, from the, as a result of that. So her question was, why have the Cori cycle? It seems to be inefficient 
because it's producing all this uh, stuff and that's energy intensive. Gluconeogenesis costs energy. The question that the student asked me after class today was, well, if I look at how much energy it takes to make glucose in gluconeogenesis and I look at how much energy I get out when I break down glucose in the muscle cells, so I'm making it in the liver, I'm breaking it down in the muscle cells, I have a net loss of energy, which is related to your question, why am I doing this? Okay. First of all, you're doing it because the muscle cells need it. The muscle cells are exercising heavily. They don't have enough oxygen. And when they don't have enough oxygen, they need 19 times as much glucose to produce the same amount of ATP as they do when oxygen is abundant. So if they don't have this oxygen, I'm sorry, they don't have this glucose that the liver is producing in the Cori cycle, they will starve. So that's the number one reason why it happens. His puzzlement about, well, it takes more energy to make it than I get out, it seemed like it didn't make any sense. Okay? And I said, none of metabolism makes sense. He didn't like that answer, by the way. Okay? None of metabolism makes sense. Why? Because we're always taking in more than we're producing. That's why we eat. Our eating is a reflection of the fact that we don't capture perfectly all of the energy in releasing it as we do in synthesis. So we need to be able to synthesize glucose for when the body doesn't have glucose in its diet, which is what the liver is doing in gluconeogenesis. Okay? But that deficit between what it takes to make glucose and what we get out of glucose has to be provided by some other source. That's our food. Does that make sense? So it, you're right, and he's right. It does take more energy to make that glucose than what the muscles are going to get out of it. Okay? But without that energy, the muscles are dead in the water. So that's why the Cori cycle is important. Okay? Yeah? But so under aerobic conditions, don't the muscles get more out of it? I don't know the idea is. Yeah, so under aerobic conditions, aren't the muscles getting more out of it? One of the biggest misperceptions people have about what aerobic means is what you just stated. Okay? When people talk about things going aerobic, they're really talking about them going anaerobic. They call it aerobic because why? When you start doing this, what do you do? You start breathing heavily, right? That's the aerobic part. Your blood doesn't deliver oxygen as efficiently as you can take it in by breathing. Okay? That's why the Cori cycle is important. And that's why when you exercise, okay, when you exercise, you actually lose weight. Why? Because it takes 19 times as much glucose when oxygen is low as when oxygen is high. So when you think you're going aerobic, you're really going anaerobic. And when you're going anaerobic, you're burning down more things than you would if you were aerobic. You don't want your muscle cells to be aerobic. You want them to be anaerobic if you want to lose weight. Make sense? That's always shocking to everybody. It's like, but aerobics are this. No, no, no. What you've been taught about aerobics is completely wrong. It's completely wrong. Are you satisfied? You're not satisfied with that. OK. Yes. If you are aerobic, you're right. right. If you are aerobic, if you have plenty of oxygen, that's correct. So the debt only happens when all you're doing is going back and running glycolysis and then going back and doing You've always got to, if you're relying on glucose that you make, you will always have a debt. You will always have a debt because you don't get as much energy out of the glucose that you make as it takes to make it. That debt is paid for by you eating. The gap is, your eating is necessary. If you didn't have a gap, you would not have to eat a thing. Okay? You would be perfect. One of the things I talk about, this is a little bit off topic, but I realized after class today, I didn't get a chance to talk about my photosynthetic fish. Okay? So I've got a photosynthetic fish idea that 
if you'd like, I'd be happy to tell you about it here. Would you like to hear the photosynthetic? This, you won't be responsible for this, but the photosynthetic fish is something that you guys already know how to make, and you don't know it yet, okay? The photosynthetic fish. How do you make a photosynthetic fish? Well, you ever see these little uh, fish in the aquarium stores that are transparent, that you can see right through them? That's my starting point. I want a fish that I can see through, okay? Second, what do I want? I want a protein called bacterial rhodopsin. I mentioned it earlier in the class, and I said it was a protein that had in the middle of it a vitamin A molecule. And when you shine light on this vitamin A molecule, what does it do? It does this. It bends back and forth, isomerizing from a trans to a cis configuration. And in bacteria, what that protein does is every time it does this kicking thing, it kicks a proton out of the cell. So what it does is in the presence of light, it creates a proton gradient. Pretty cool. Just by kicking. And the kicking happens because of the light. What if you take bacteria rhodopsin and you put it in the inner mitochondrial membrane of a transparent fish? And you turn the light on. What's going to happen? It's going to create a proton gradient. Without any oxidation, needing only light, it's going to create a proton gradient. And if you can make a proton gradient, you can make ATP. Now, I lie a little bit in calling it a photosynthetic fish because photosynthesis involves a light cycle and a dark cycle. In the dark cycle, what plants do is they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they fix it. The photosynthetic fish wouldn't have the ability to do that. It would only have the light cycle half of photosynthesis. But it would have so much ATP, okay, that it would, its need to eat would be very, very greatly diminished. Its primary need for food would only be carbon. It needs to have a carbon source. Okay? Now, I've told this to many classes. I've said, go take it. Go use this idea. I've actually talked to people who work on mitochondria, and they say, yeah, I think it might work. Go do it. Somebody please do it. I just want 1% of all the things that you get, or whatever. I'm joking. but, but, but it's, 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 a, it's a, an idea that I think somebody should, should try and do. I don't have the time to do it. You guys understand how it works, though? Okay. All right, back to questions. Yes? Um, so I had a question in a different video that talked about gramicidin. Gramicidin, huh? Gramicidin. So yep. And then does the electron transport system operate Okay, so the question is, does an electron transport system operate whether or not there's a proton gradient? And that's related to what gramicidin, gramicidin is a, um, a whole, a pore former in a membrane. So it'll, it will allow things to leak through the membrane, and it's actually used, it's actually a biocontrol agent used by some, I want to say insects, I can't recall the, the organism, that use it to uh, kill other organisms. Okay, so they take this and inject this thing into them. It now causes leakage out of the cell. Cell dies. But your question was, will electron transport happen if there's no proton gradient? How many say yes? How many say no? Okay, yes it will. Certainly, it will. Now, that's why, for example, the, the DNP is a miracle diet drug. Because it destroys the proton gradient, and the proton gradient is what keeps electron transport from going crazy, right? But when you've got no proton gradient, there's nothing to stop electron transport, so it starts going like crazy. Concentration of NAD goes up, and when concentration of NAD goes up, citric acid cycle and glycolysis go wonko. So yes, it does not take a proton gradient for electron transport to occur. Okay, will, if that occurs, will you still be making ATP? Not if you destroy the proton gradient. No, intact will not destroy the proton gradient. Putting a hole in something will destroy the proton gradient. You destroy the proton gradient, electron transport will go like crazy, but no ATP will be made. That's why the cells die, or the people who took the diet drug died, because they couldn't make ATP. Make sense? 
the proton gradient. And if you have a hole in the dam such that the water is going through the hole instead of going through the turbine to make the electricity, then you've got no way to make ATP. Yes, ma'am? So the point with that magic diet drug, are they making no ATP or just less? Well, the reality depends on how many of these you've got, how big the holes are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they will definitely make less, and depending upon the severity of the, um, the loss of the integrity of the membrane, they could be making none. So, but it's, it's, it's a measure of, it's, it's a function of quantity, okay? Good questions, guys. Yeah. Uh, what was the uh, mechanism uh, responsible for, uh, I believe it was cardiolipin triggering um, cell death? Yeah, what's the mechanism by which cardiolipin triggers cell, de cell death? I actually have a figure for that, so I might as well put it up. Let's put the figure for that up. Um, cardiolipin comes up. Right um, here, and cardiolipin and apoptosis is right here. So this figure is not the best figure in the world, but cardiolipin is simply a component of the inner mitochondrial membrane that is sensitive, excuse me, to reactive oxygen damage. So reactive oxygen species you've seen, I've described to you on several occasions about how they are problematic for the cell and they're generated by mitochondria. So mitochondria are very sensitive to uh, reactive oxygen species. And this um, is a way for the mitochondrion to tell the cell, I've been damaged, uh, we need to commit suicide. And that's what it's doing. So the cardiolipin gets damaged. When it gets damaged, it, f it favors the release of cytochrome C. And the release of cytochrome C is a signal to the cell that it's time to commit suicide, apoptosis. That's as much of an answer as I've got for you, unfortunately. Yeah? Is it the cardiolipin, cardiolipin that's being damaged by the RLS, or is it the mitochondrial membranes? Both. Both. So damage to the mitochondrial membrane will cause the cardiolipin itself to be um, um, uh, damaged and release this. So one of the things that happens with damage to membranes is one of the reasons that you have, uh, for example, um, um, vitamin E in your membranes is that you can actually see a chain reaction of events happening in the membrane. That damage to one thing can trigger other damage events to happen, and so that's actually what's happening here. Yes? Um, that's a good question. Is there anything else involved in the release of cytochrome C? And the answer is yes. This is a sim simplification of the process, but cardiolipin is involved in the process. Yes. Now I know how to make the exam really hard, huh? Actually, I've written most of the exam. I mean, I've got to proof it over tonight, but it's already, it's already pretty much written. So. But this gives me an idea about how well you guys are thinking about stuff. And I have to say, these are very good questions. Yeah? Hypothetically, if you had a cytochrome C deficiency, okay. would your cells not be triggered to die? Okay. If you had a cytochrome C deficiency, let's just take that at face value and say, what would happen? cell had cytochrome C deficiency. What do you think would happen to a cell that had a cytochrome C deficiency? It would probably die. Why? It have limited electron transport. Yeah. So consequently, it wouldn't make ATP. So it probably wouldn't even take that kind of signaling to happen. It would simply die because it didn't have enough energy. Right, because electron transport is responsible for about 95 to 99 percent of your ATP production in the cell. So if you do anything significant to that, you got trouble. One of the things that we like to think about when we think about, um, uh, I don't have any energy, right? You wake up Monday morning, you feel, oh my God, I don't have any energy to go to class. I've got to, or I've got to feel that way when I'm lecturing. I don't have any lecture energy to lecture, right? The image that we have in our heads that we have no ATP. But we've probably, when we're absolutely dragging, we've probably knocked down our ATP level maybe 10%. Okay? If we were all the way at zero, we would be dead. Kind of, 
<laughs> Not a good thought, is it? <laughs> but the ATP level doesn't change as much as you might think it would. Yes? So referring to like, um, I don't know if I'm sorry, of the respiratory control, when you're talking about tightly coupled, are you talking about yes. like, the relationship between ATP and ATP? Like okay, very good question here. When I say tightly coupled with respect to respiratory control, what do I mean? That's basically what you're saying, right? Okay, so her question was, does it relate to ATP and ADP? And it does indirectly, but that's not what, re what, what tightly coupled means. Tightly coupled means this one thing. Okay, tightly coupled means that you have an intact mitochondrial mem inner membrane so that electron transport depends on oxidative phosphorylation and vice versa. That's what tightly coupled means. So you're, the coupling that we're talking about is electron transport with oxidative phosphorylation. So if I stop oxidative phosphorylation, I will stop electron transport. Why? Proton gradient gets too high, the battery gets too charged, right? If I stop electron transport, I will stop oxidative phosphorylation. Why? Gradient will dissipate, right? Nothing to keep putting protons out there, therefore the gradient will equalize on both sides and no more ATP will be made. So there, when, when and that, those things happen when you have an inner mitochondrial membrane that's intact. That is, no protons are moving across it, except those that are going through complex five. Okay? Is that a hand up there? Must not be. Yes? Um, you say that it would dissipate, yet you said that it's tight enough with um, in or out. So how, what do you mean it dissipates if it dissipates? Okay. So what do I mean when I say that the proton gradient will dissipate if I say nothing comes in or out? I'm saying nothing is coming in or out across the membrane away from complex five. Complex five, when you have a tightly coupled system, all the proton movement is through complex five. Now, the way for protons to move across complex five requires a gradient. More protons out than in. So if I have nothing putting more protons out, then that gradient over time is just gonna fall. Just like if I poke a hole in the dam, the water level is gonna fall all the way to the place where the hole is, right? Make sense? So that's what's happening when I say dissipate. The two will be equal on, other si on either side of that, okay? And that happens because it's going through complex five and everything has stopped, okay? Yes? If your complex one stops working, yeah. you can just skip it and do the succinate thing, right? Go through mm -hmm. that one. Would you just have a smaller proton gradient? Okay. Okay, so the question was, let's give the cell some rotenone and block complex one. And I said that there's ways around that, okay? And you're saying, would you just simply have less electron transport, therefore make less ATP, et cetera? And the answer is yes, but for the most part, it would be pretty nasty for a cell, okay? Because there's not nearly as much FADH2 in a cell as there is NADH in a cell. So you could tolerate a little bit, you know, but you wouldn't tolerate a lot. Yeah. And the thing that turns out is that insects, insect muscle, which I didn't get, I, I talk about it in the 450, not in the 451, but insect muscle is very sensitive to uh, changes um, in the um, complex one. Insect muscle is very, very quick. Think about a fly. You go to swat a fly, and the fly is gone before you can, you can swat it, right? Its ability to um, contract and get the, get the uh, insect out of that danger is almost immediate, okay? It turns out that, I haven't mentioned it in class, and I regret not mentioning it in class, but since I didn't, you're not responsible for it, but I'll tell you here. NADH and NAD and FADH2 and FAD do not cross the inner mitochondrial membrane. They don't cross it. Now that's problematic if you're making a lot of NADH out in the cytoplasm. Where's one place where you would make NADH at in the cytoplasm? From last term. Glycolysis, right? See, if you have glycolysis going like crazy, you got all this NADH 
out there in the cytoplasm, the best use of that NADH would be in the mitochondrion where you can make a proton gradient, right? But if the NADH doesn't cross the inner mitochondrial membrane, then in a sense you're kind of throwing it away. Well, we have what, what are, what's called a shuttle system where the electrons of NADH get donated to something else and the something else gets moved across the mitochondrion and then once it gets inside the reverse happens so that NAD gains electrons becomes NADH. And in us, that's a system that's 100% efficient and the only problem is it's slow. In insects, they have a very inefficient process that takes the NADH and donates it to something that then converts it into FADH2 on the inside. So they're making something that's less energetic. You get less of a proton gradient. It has the advantage of being fast, but the disadvantage is that it takes a lot of NADH to make this happen. If you start screwing with the amount of NADH that's present in the cell, then the mitochond I'm sorry, the, uh, the insect becomes much more sensitive to it. So that's more than what you wanted to know, but that's, that's, uh, that's what's happening with that. Metabolism is so cool. There's so many things you know if you know metabolism. Yes? Well, I think you should basically know what anaplerotic and cataplerotic is. I think that you should know that the citric acid cycle intermediates are involved in those other things. That is, other pathways or other pathways can donate molecules in there. General sorts of things. The specific ones that I talked about in class, and that's always my guideline, is what I talk about in class. The specific ones I talked about in class included glutamic acid and alpha-ketoglutarate, exaloacetate and aspartic acid, because those are very simple kinds of reactions that allow this exchange back and forth. I can take protein, I can make it into citric acid cycle intermediates through glutamic acid and aspartic acid going to alpha-ketoglutarate and exaloacetate. I can take those intermediates from the citric acid cycle and use them to make aspartic acid and glutamic acid, which is important for the synthesis of proteins. That's a real good example right there, okay? Yeah. So catapleurotic reactions are reactions where you can pull them out and use them elsewhere. Yes, right. My watch tells me when I get a text, so I was just getting a text. And it wasn't saying shut up either, so. Yes? Um, I remember you mentioned something called the Nernst equation to measure chemical potential. Or the Nernst equation you're talking about? Yeah, yeah uh-huh. Well, what I would say is I think I was pretty specific in that lecture about what I thought was important. So I would refer you to that lecture, okay? They can be used to make amino acids, that's correct. And then would be the other way. Yeah, so there was some confusion. I think one, there's somebody said I had a lecture or a, an aid online that said the opposite of what was there, which is why I'm not specifically going through that here, okay? I want you to know that there's directionality to these things. And as long as you know the directionality, the fact that this can go to that or that can go back to this, I'm happy. I'm not going to say, is this anaplerotic or cataplerotic? I, I'm not going to do that to you, okay? Fair enough? One of the things that I, I've tried to do in, whenever I give exams is there's, you know, much as I know, I know it's hard to believe, but professors are not perfect. 
And so you would always, I would always like to be 100% clear on everything that I say, but there's sometimes the mouth doesn't go where the brain wants you to go, right? And so when I look over a lecture and I think about what I said or I think about things that were there and they were confusing, then the last thing in the world I want to do is, is put that on an exam unless I clarify the confusion. And if I haven't clarified that confusion, then I feel like it's not that big of a deal to go back and make a big deal of it. Because if I go back and I start talking about anapleurotic, catapleurotic, and everybody goes, oh my god, this is important. They're going to spend a disproportionate amount of time on it to do stuff, right? So in general, I will be careful when I've been unclear in things to not um, uh, test on them. That's basically what I'm saying. Yes? I have a question Yes? So we talked about how you can attach different animals and like Yes. Yep. Um, also an example um, where the latest diabetics are attached to like a protein. Yes. Yes. Okay. So her question had to do with the attachment of oligosaccharides to various molecules in the cell. And so when I talked about the attachment of oligosaccharides to sphingolipids, I talked about the synthesis of gangliosides. Um, if I attach a simple sugar, like one sugar to a sphingolipid, I make a cerebroside. It's important, and then I also talked uh, elsewhere about glycoproteins, where proteins get oligosaccharides put onto them and they act like license plates. So basically, I think if I understand the questions, you want some clarification about what all those, how all those relate. Is that, am I saying that correct? Okay, so the sphingolipids are not involved in license plates. Sphingolipids are only involved in membranes of cells, primarily nerve cells. Primarily nerve cells. It's not exclusive, but primarily nerve cells are where you, where you find sphingolipids. They form part of the lipid bilayer. Okay? But the oligosaccharides that are on there are not involved in license plating. License plating happens as a result of the glycosylation of the proteins to make gly glycoproteins. Okay? Sure. Yeah. You can took and duke it out. Um, so you talked about phosphatides and how like they're structurally related to um, like plasmalogens and sphingolipids. Uh huh. Um, when you talked about icosanoids. Yes. Okay, so good question. So I talked about phosphatides and I talked about plasmalogens. I'm not even sure I talked about plasmalogens, but I think they pop up in the highlights. Plasmalogens are just simply compounds that are very much like uh, glycerophospholipids, but they have ether bonds instead of having ester bonds. That's the only difference uh, there. And then I talked about uh, icosanoids. And so the question was, is there a relationship between the glycerophospholipids, plasmalogens, and icosanoids. Is that, is that your question? Okay. So there's not a relationship between them. Okay. Not direct. But I'll, I'm going to muddy the picture for you. Okay. So a glycerophospholipid is something that has a glycerol backbone. It has two fatty acids attached to it. It has a phosphate. And if it has something attached to that phosphate, it's a phosphatide. Okay. So that's what a phosphatide is. It's a glycerophospholipid that has something attached to the phosphate, okay? A plasmalogen is just a glycerophospholipid that instead of having an, an ester bond of the uh, uh, fatty acids attached to the glycerol, it has an ether bond. That's, that's the only difference, okay? Now, um, the muddying happens when I think about icosanoids. I didn't talk about this in class, so you're not responsible for what I'm going to tell you. You like that when I tell you this, I'm sure, right? How do we get icosanoids. Well, you get icosanoids from arachidonic acid, right? I think people have gotten that down pretty well. You get icosanoids from arachidonic acid. Well, the question then is, where in the hell do you get arachidonic acid? What's that? Uh, I'm not picking on you. I just, I didn't hear what you said. Okay. You get arachidonic acid from glycerophospholipids. <laughs> okay. 
So it turns out that arachidonic acid, you don't want to have it floating around in the cell. Because if it's floating around the cell, what's going to happen is the cyclooxygenase is going to convert it into prostaglandins, and then you're going to have things like pain and so forth that you don't want, right? You want the, the, the uh, arachidonic acid to be controlled in amount in the cell. So the way it's controlled is that you have a, um, an enzyme known as a lipase. There's a specific lipase that will cleave the fatty acid on position number two of a glycerol phospholipid. What's the characteristics of a fatty acid at position two? Unsaturated. And what's the most unsaturated fatty acid we've talked about? Arachidonic acid. So if you start cleaving at position two and you cleave long enough, you're going to release some arachidonic acid. Right? You know something that favors the activation of a lipase that cuts right there? Do you know what it is? The protein in bee sting. One of the reasons bee sting hurts like crazy at the place where you get it is because it's favoring the activation of the lipase that's cutting off that arachidonic acid that's favoring the production of prostaglandins that are associated with pain. Okay? You think of the pain that you get with a bee sting, which is pretty significant, you don't want to have that amount of arachidonic acid floating around your cell normally. Okay? So it's normally contained in the membranes. Cells do release a little bit of it when they need to make prostaglandins and they activate that lipase, but it's a very controlled kind of a release. Does that help? Uh, let me answer, answer another question that I think will come up that I've, I've been asked. This is the most common question I've gotten from everybody so far. Okay, what's the difference between an eicosanoid, a prostanoid, and leukotriene? That's the most common question I've had this term, okay? It says that your professor did not make that very clear, okay? So here's the difference between them, all right? An eicosanoid is a 20 carbon molecule made from arachidonic acid, okay? Uh, let me back up. Uh, now I, now I'm, I'm, I'm even saying it wrong. An eicosanoid is a 20 carbon molecule. Okay? Making it from arachidonic acid is one way. They can also be made, some of them, like the leukotrienes, can be made from linolenic acid, which only has 18 carbons. It takes addition of two carbons to make leukotrienes. So leukotrienes are eicosanoids, but they're not prostanoids. Prostanoids require arachidonic acid. That's what I said wrong before. Prostanoids are made from arachidonic acid. Prostanoids include the prostaglandins and they include the thromboxanes because the thromboxanes are made from the prostaglandins, or the prostanoids. It's confusing, okay? So the answer is they can indirectly, but they're most commonly made from linolenic acid, okay? Yes? Um, so for the superoxide disputase and the catalase, uh, I was wondering if they were coupled or if they're like related in... Oh, that's a good question. So you saw that reaction that I, or the two reactions that I showed in class today. Her question had to do with superoxide dismutase and catalase, which I showed today in a figure um, right, uh, no, I'm sorry, that was the previous one, so I had to go back here to get it. I showed in a figure right, uh, no, not there, it was here, okay? so. I showed that figure and you see here's superoxide dismutase. Remember this has two steps, okay? There's only one shown there. And then it shows catalase. And your question is, are these coupled in some way? The answer is, as far as I know, no. Okay? Insects don't have catalase. Right? Insects don't have catalase. Actually, I don't know about insects. Bacteria don't have catalase. Bacteria, Bacteria don't have catalase. I don't know about insects. Yeah. Go, what you want to do is go collect a mosquito and pour some some hydrogen peroxide on it and see if it bubbles or not, okay? If it does, then you'd say, okay, it's got catalase. Yeah? So the um, like two-step reaction of the superoxide 
Can yes. Can you that side? So the two-step reaction of superoxide dismutase, that's the ping-pong reaction, and that's the um, slide right here, okay? Um, so the two, uh, the O2 Okay, so this is superoxide right here. That's right. So her question is, are the red ones new ones? Yes. This one gets converted into this. All right? And this one gets converted into this. Right? So this one, it pulls the electron off. That's why you go from plus two to plus one. And this one gains an electron from here, making it go back to plus two. And by gaining an electron, it's essentially an O2 minus minus, but that picks up two protons to become H2O2. Yeah. So the protons are just uh, available in the solution. Right? But the most important thing is by adding another electron to this, you've got O2 minus minus. It really wants protons. It really wants protons. So it has two protons and becomes H2O2. That makes sense? Clear as mud. Okay. Yes. How does the superoxide come about? Very good question. Superoxide comes about because of incomplete reduction of oxygen. Where are we reducing oxygen? There's a good exam question. Specifically, where are we reducing oxygen? Complex four of the electron transport system. And it takes four electrons, one at a time, to do that. So if something interrupts that process, you get an incompletely reduced oxygen. Mm -hmm. This would be in the mitochondrion. Yep. Remember when we think about blood, we're talking about extracellular. So mitochondrion is in intracellular, right? And, but let me also back up and say something here. So that isn't to say that we don't have reactive oxygen species in our blood. We do have reactive oxygen species in our blood, and they are a factor for smokers. Smokers, in, because of the, the nature of cigarette smoke, ingest a fair amount of reactive oxygen species. It goes into their blood and causes many of the problems, including atherosclerosis, that we see associated with smokers in the blood. So, yes, thank you for letting me say that. Yeah? Just to clarify, you only have these particular superoxide and uh, reactive oxygen species inside your mitochondria. They don't, they don't leave mitochondria. So in the cell, these guys would never make it out because they would react before they had a chance to get out, right? Yes? So, um, the electrons basically get separated into single electrons when the cytochrome C gets involved? So, they get separated into single electrons when they pass through coenzyme Q. Okay. Cytochrome C is only able to accept one at a time. So, that's why I call coenzyme Q the traffic cop. It accepts a pair, but it passes them off one at a time. And that's in the Q cycle. It's a very good question. It's a very, very good question. The question is, can reactive oxygen species come from other places, not just complex four? And in fact, there's increasing evidence that people think that the reactive oxygen species are coming as a result of problems earlier in electron transport. It's easy to think about and see uh, that with complex four because you see four different ones coming in one at a time. But it's probably the case that some of the reactive oxygen species are actually being made earlier in the transport system. But that's more complicated. Uh, so three hands. Back over here. For the Q cycle, do we have to know the specifics of like, the proton pumping or just know the protons? Okay. So in this Q cycle, are you supposed to know the specifics of the proton uh, pumping or just the fact that protons get pumped? Well, as always, my guideline there is whatever I said in class. So use what I said in class as your guideline for the depth of understanding of that, okay? Yes? Yes. Is it, do they just take the extra electron from the superoxide? Another very good question. So antioxidants, how do they work? Do they just take that extra electron and do their thing? The answer is, in simple terms, yes, that's what they do. Vitamin C is very readily, okay, um, 
uh, able to accept electrons and do that. Yes. Vitamin C is, is interesting in that it's, it's, it's very able, to, it's very readily oxidized, and it also can go the other direction and be reduced. So that gives the cell a lot of flexibility. Yep. Is there another hand? <laughs> Infomercials on CoQ10. Okay. Is it the same, is it the same one? Yeah. yeah. Same thing. Okay. Yep. I just oh, are you asking, is that, oh, is CoQ10 coenzyme Q that I'm talking about? Yes, it is. Yeah. The reason they call it CoQ10 um, is that coenzyme Q, actually, if you look at it, has a long hydrophobic tail sticking off of it, and that's how it actually sticks in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So if that's 10 units long, they call it CoQ10. It doesn't have to be 10, it could be 12, it could be 20, but that's why they call it Co CoQ10. Um, I would not describe CoQ10 as an antioxidant, no. no. <laughs> a little anxiety about putting a hand up there, okay. Yes? Um, so regarding complex core, and you said um, uses four protons. Four electrons. Four, okay, four electrons. What, what was the point of using four? So why, does, why do I talk about four electrons with complex four? That's your question, yeah. right? Okay, so why, what's the magic about four electrons with complex four? What's the term, the terminal electron acceptor is oxygen, right? And if you give molecular oxygen four electrons, what are you going to make? You're going to make something that's got four negative charges on two oxygen atoms, right? And we saw before that if oxygen has two negative charges on it, what's it going to grab? Protons. So that's why you're making two waters, okay? So you've got molecular oxygen, which is O2. It takes four electrons to reduce that and four protons to join to that to make two waters, okay? That's why, you, that's why it takes four. Is that a question? Yes, sir. Uh, today when you were going over the isoprene, the five carbon. Yes. Uh, how many carbons is it? Oh, okay, good question. So question uh, was uh, if uh, I talk about isoprenes, um, we hear other terms that are used relative to lipids called terpenes. How many carbons does a terpene have? Terpenes have um, basically multiples of five. Multiples of five, yes. Um, it gets a little confusing because those terpenes can then be modified so that they might have something that's not a, mo a multiple of five. But the basic terpene molecule will have uh, multiples of five. Is this helping? These are very good questions. I, a lot of times I'll get out of a review session and I'll go, oh, I, you know, I don't know if that made any difference or not. Maybe this prompting everybody to come with questions was good because I, it has helped keep it focused. Um, and so I think that's been very good. Question back in the back. Um, after the formation of the nostril, the 30 carbon, yes. we went on in class today to talk about the antipodal parts. Yes. Okay. So I talked um, about the uh, formation of linosterol, and then I talked about how that could be modified to become amphiphilic. And I don't think I have a figure to show you is the problem with that. Yes. No, I'll, I'll describe it, but I don't think I've got a figure to show you. Yeah. See, the problem is it doesn't show the structure of bile acids. The bile acids are the part that makes the amphiphilic. So the only amphiphilic molecules on here are the bile acids. So that's why I say the bile acids are called acids because they either get a carboxylation of the uh, cholesterol to occur or they get an acid like serine attached to it that then gives a polarity to it. So suffice it to say if I took cholesterol, and by the way, these, all, these modifications all occur out here. All right. So let's say I put a serine out here. Serine is an amino acid, so it's got a carboxyl group, it's got an amine group. I put a serine out here. This part of the molecule is going to be negative. It's going to be uh, a charged, right? Negative and positive. If I put serine out here, 
it's going to be charged, whereas the rest of this thing down here is uncharged. That's the amphiphilic nature. So we, amphiphilic means that something has partly uncharged and partly charged. Fatty acid was a good example. Fatty acid has a carboxyl at one end, carbons and hydrogens at the other end. So the carboxyl is charged, the carbons and hydrogens are not charged, okay? And that's an amphiphilic molecule. That amphiphilic fatty acid can be used as a soap because the carboxyl part will inter interact with water, the nonpolar part will interact with other nonpolar molecules like grease and oil and so forth. Am I answering your question? Okay, but it's only the bile acids that are amphiphilic. So sorry if I was, if I was not clear on that. Yes? Okay, how do statins inhibit the HMG CoA reductase? They use a trick that you learned last term. And the trick that you learned last term is competitive inhibition. Tell me the characteristics of competitive inhibition. It binds the active site. It binds the active site. And how is it able to bind the active site? How do competitive inhibitors work? The what? They resemble the normal substrate in structure, okay? HMG-CoA, I'm, I'm sorry, statins res resemble HMG. Or I'm sorry, HMG-CoA. They resemble HMG-CoA. So they compete with that for the binding at the active site, okay? And as a consequence, the enzyme doesn't get to bind the normal substrate as, as frequently, and therefore less product is made. So that's how that actually happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this gets a little complicated, uh, but I will give you, I, I'm not familiar with the bile acid uh, binding ones, but I am familiar with the importance of recycling of cholesterol. I think what you're talking about, they're actually inhibiting the uptake of these in the diet. Right. So if you can't solubilize cholesterol like with bile acids, then you're, it's going to pass through the system. So that would probably be a factor for dietary cholesterol. All right? There are other considerations, and I'm not sure if that's the case here or not, but there are other considerations with cholesterol. Cholesterol normally, the only way that you get rid of cholesterol, you don't metabolize it. You shit it out. Okay? So that's how you get rid of cholesterol. And it turns out that you don't shit it out real well because your system is very good at, at taking it back up. There's a recycle system that will pull it out of your feces and um, put it back into play. So one of the strategies for um, lowering cholesterol levels in the body are to reduce the uptake from the feces. So it's possible that that's coming from there. I don't know that that's not. Um, but there are different strategies to have that happen. Okay? You would predict based on what I told you today, that if you, were take, if you were messing with the bile acids, you would see effects besides cholesterol, right? What, would you, what else would you expect to see? You would see different nutrient absorbance, and the specific nutrient absorbance differences you would see would be what? Fats. So you would take up less fat from your diet. You say, hey, great diet drug, but the problem is that if you don't take fat out of your diet, then you get the runs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's probably one of the side effects that you're going to have with something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'll do is uh, let's, let's call it a night. Um, I imagine people are getting hungry like I'm getting hungry. Uh, we'll call it a night. I will get the video posted probably first thing in the morning. Um, and I will be in my office tomorrow, so if you have questions, come see me. I should also be in my office on Friday morning, so if you have questions, come see me. Meanwhile, study your butts off, and let's see you do well. <laughs>